today I'm going to be doing my best books of 2023. Can you imagine that this is going to be my seventh year on booktube and this is my first time doing a generic best of books because I feel kind of always a little afraid of doing them. I have a very hard time talking about books that I really love. I don't know if you have this problem but when you really love a book you're like you feel so overwhelmed and yet you can't like actually you know express what you feel. You're like it's, it's in the heart, it's in the neck, it's in you know the brain and all of the wonderful things and when you don't like a book or you feel middling about a book I can like explain it fine but when I really have strong feelings I really struggle with that and also I read across genre pretty widely and across age range pretty widely so it's very hard to compare contrast so I decided this year I'm going to do four favorite lists. So I'm going to do this one which is going to be contemporary books, not actually contemporary books, but books published in the 21st century. I'm going to do classic books, I'm going to do nonfiction books, and I'm going to do a children's and middle grades book one as well. This list is not going to have a direct order. I consider doing more than 10 because there's so many books that I absolutely loved and I may do an honorable mentions list. The last two are books that are like my favorites of the year. The place I'm going to start is actually probably one of the best books on this list and it is Brown Girls and this one I am completely floored by and I picked it up because of the Carol Shields Prize which rendered some really amazing books. And this book follows a group of girls growing up in Queens and it follows them from middle school all the way into college and throughout their lives and it is really really brilliant. I have fallen in love with Coral narration this year where we have many different people and we don't really have names we have them intersecting their different points of view and I loved the ways in which it talks about the various kinds of ways someone's life can do like it's talking about in middle school and high school people who you know didn't drink and people who did and as we get older I cried so much because I thought the way in which they grow older and look at their mothers and we really look at the ways in which people who stayed and people who left and their contrasting points of view of why did you leave our city like why did you leave our borough versus why wouldn't you want to leave and there's really interesting conversations and it is a short compact very very poetic book i was like i cried so many times and i just really really loved the ways in which andreas like portrayed this and I'm so excited to see what she writes next. The next book I'm going to talk about is Yellow Face by R.F. Khan. I have been going on to a discovery of her books. I have known about her since the Poppy War days and then I did not pick up anything until last year where I read Babel which was definitely one of my favorite books of last year. And this is publishing thriller book that really starts with two writers who have known each other for a really long time and one of them, the white writer, has always felt like she is falling behind. Like she, her work has never got the same success. So after her friend dies in an accident, she takes her manuscript and she heavily, heavily edits it to kind of make it the bubble wrapping, the veneer of Asianness without actually including a lot of the suffering and colonialism and conversation that the original writer really did include. And I think that is just a clever, amazing book because I can tell the ways in which you start to empathize because when someone is narrating a book you always want to empathize with them you're in their brain you're understanding and then you just see the racism you see the different aspects and i know that like it's a book that you just feel uncomfortable reading and i think that it's a really necessary book in the landscape of publishing now and conversations and the way that because we talk about diversity people think that you know people who are diverse are somehow more privileged which is just absurd if you actually follow anything just because uplifting is happening a little bit does not erase the ways in which like systematically people are being left out and how that is often just dressing on a cake and a system that just has nothing below it. It's like yes we uplift these three authors and these hundred authors we're just not talking about and yeah I just think that it's a really beautiful book and I really love the way that R.F. Kwan writes. The next book I'm going to talk about is The Other Bennett Sister by Jane Hadlow and I'm so excited that I picked this up. I picked it up in Jane Austen July and I had such a blast and an emotional ride reading this. This follows Mary, the younger sister of Elizabeth Bennet. So if you're not familiar with the Bennet sisters, there is five of them. And we kind of meet Jane, who's the most beautiful, calm, peaceful, and then Elizabeth, who's like witty and wise. And then we have the younger two, which are Kitty and Lydia, and they're a little silly and frilious and they flirt a lot. And then we have the middle sister named Mary, and she is very plain, very serious, and she says a lot of things that are a lot of what I would say at 12 years old, you know, trying to be more sophisticated, trying to be more proper, but kind of getting things wrong a little bit, and also just being kind of rude a little bit. And I really liked this story because we see this character in such fullness. It touches a lot on a topic that I really love, which is the idea that 
the way in which we perceive ourselves really influence the way that we see the world. This is something that happens in Blue Castle as well, one of my favorite books by L.M. Montgomery and many other books in which I think that beauty is very subjective. I don't think that anyone is unbeautiful in my opinion and I think that so often when you are told negative things about yourself you do hide yourself, you withdraw into this and Mary is constantly compared to her older sisters and stuff like that and her mother is cruel and abusive in this novel as you can kind of see the ways in which she is that way and neglectful in the book. I think that the ways in which she is constantly told that she's plain and she's constantly told that she's not valuable, you really see that and you see the ways in which she believes this about herself and it is such a powerful story about her coming of age as a woman in her 20s. I like the way that many of the characters that are so loved in the original are not represented perfectly here and also some characters that are more critically treated actually get a little bit of redemption here and we see the ways in which we misunderstand each other and I think that it's a really wonderful and powerful book. I cried, I loved it. I felt like I was being immersed in early 19th century. We have painting, we have multiple love interests, we have time passing and just great found family as well which I think is just so powerful and wonderful. One of the most difficult books that I read this year was Nightcrawling by Leila Motley. She wrote it at 19 and I believe it was published when she was 20 and it definitely heard the rounds last year in 2022 but I didn't have the courage to pick it up for a while because I knew that it was going to be a really hard book and this deals with the ways in which girls and women are trafficked in Oakland and in California and I really want to highlight Girl here because she is 17 years old and I think that the way that we describe this book often includes black woman which she's a black girl and I think that all of the things that happen to her are terrible regardless of the person but the fact that she's a minor during these experiences compounds and compounds the effects of it and Molly is a poet and you can tell that she writes nuanced and beautifully and you feel the feelings and it, it deals both with sexually abusive relationships and with racism but it also deals with family dynamics and the ways in which we have grief and suffering and misunderstanding and hurt and the ways that we tell stories about ourselves and I think that it is such an intensely good book. It also deals with poverty and hunger and the ways that adultification really happens. She not only has adultification sexually but also familiarly and financially and through all of these things and I had to stop more than once in this book to just cry and I was trying to read my review and also felt that way and I think that I would recommend this to pretty much anyone even though it's really hard I was talking to this with my friend who's a survivor of sexual abuse and she said that's really hard but actually the way that it's depicted I think is cathartic in many ways it reminds me in that way of Know My Name by Chanel Miller, which is a nonfiction account of a rape case. And I think the ways in which these books talk about it is incredibly hard, incredibly difficult, but incredibly necessary. I purposely formatted my books so that I would have, you know, a breather after talking about Nightcrawling, but it also feels very strange to go into this side, which is Mysteries of Thorn Manor. This is a YA fantasy that is a companion piece to a previous novel, Sorcery of Thorns, which I read in 2019 and absolutely loved. And I wasn't really sure, maybe, you know, it's just the nostalgia, maybe I'd overended the ways in which I love this book. But I really, really love diving back into this world. It has this magicalness that just pervades it. I really love when you feel the atmosphere and you feel the setting was so real. And to compare it to the book series that shall not be named, as well as Nevermore, those are books that I have similar feelings about being fully immersed in it. And the original synopsis is that we have this woman who is a book librarian and she actually deals with books that come alive and then we have other stories happening around that. I have a hard time because this is a sequel so it's hard to describe it but it's also a companion piece but pretty much we have this like wild manner that has all of these things like happening <laughs> and you laugh really hard but you also cry a little bit and it's just it just makes me feel full at the end of the day and that was really lovely. Another companion piece that made my top favorites of the year was River of Silver by S.A. Chakrabarty. This is a companion piece to City of Brass series, the David Bad series, and this is a series that I am just in love with. Like, I originally thought I was so skeptical when I read the first one back in 2018, and then when I read the second and third one, I was just blown away. And this one, this is so amazing, and this is a testament to why I love her as an author so much, because she is so thorough and she is so 
amazingly detailed and introspective with her characters because one of the highlights of this book is that this wasn't a book that was meant to be published first. When she was writing these characters and this large ensemble cast, there were certain scenes that could not be included because of the fact that they would necessitate spoilers because we don't know someone's identity or we don't know someone's relationship or we don't know the things going back because Nari, the main character, is not aware of those. And if we were to see these scenes, it would play the hand too soon in the trilogy. And yet we have all these things. So she wrote out massive amounts of scenes from different characters to flesh out the characters so then when they appear and we see short periods of them as a character we are not spoiled but we also she has the experience of writing these scenes and has them in the back of her hand and I think that that is just such clever writing but then you know when she was dealing with a difficult pregnancy and having writer's block she kind of went back to them and finished them and then she published them and I was like so over the moon because I really loved following it way before the beginning of the first series and then the series takes place over at least five to six years, seven years, somewhere like that and then after that as well and I am just blown away by her writing. I almost included Amina El Shabafi, her other book that she published this year and I really wanted to but I was like, you know, I think I do love this one better and I will include one author only. So that is my complete gush about S.A. Chakrabarty and her incredible writing and incredible detailed and characters that you just fall in love with and that you cry. I cry a lot, which I <laughs> know I'm going to mention a lot, but I, I do just feel so connected to all of these books. I originally picked up Stone Blind by Natalie Haynes because it was long listed for the women's prize and I fell in love with it immediately because I think that her narration is funny, it's hilarious. She narrates the audiobook so you can really tell the ways in which she is joking and the times in which her voice breaks and it has some choral point of view as well. We have some from the gods, some from the gorgons and the snakes and it's just, it's so incredible. And then we also just follow so many different characters. If you're looking for a book that focuses exclusively on Medusa, this novel is not it. It is a stumble cast and again it has some characters in which you want to like because you're following them and then you're like, hmm, decisions you're making. And overall, I think that the writing and the poetry and the humor and all of it is so amazing. I was reading through my quotes and I had to stop because I started to cry because <laughs> it does definitely deal with some hard topics. But one of the ones that I want to read is this one. She was asleep. It's important you know this because he will claim there was a battle, but there is no battle to be had between an armed man and a sleeping girl. And I think that quote just sums up this book in total. It's recasting the story of Medusa from this person who is a monster and someone who's cursed for her own misdeeds to re-examining the story and being like, hmm, how was she used? How was she treated? And then how did she have an afterlife? Because Medusa has an afterlife in these stories as well. And how does that influence it? And I loved some of the ways in which Haynes played with mythology as well. Like the ending, my goodness, I gasped out loud. It is not to do with Medusa, it's to do with one of the other characters and it is ingenious and amazing and I love when authors do that. I read other books by authors in which I have been less impressed because I don't always want to read a straight myth retelling. Like I want some new novel, some humor, some different points of view or even like comparisons and stuff. And this one just sold me out of the park. I really loved it. And then I also picked up one of her nonfiction books, Pandora's Jars, which is definitely going to be included in my nonfiction favorites of the year. It's very hard for me to rate these books. That's why I left them unrated. And yet I'm going back and rating them slightly. But I do think that this book is definitely near the top because it's just so special to me. I, I, I loved the ways in which Fatima Ashgar explored themes and stories and family in the book When We Were Sisters. And this is always a testament to giving an author a second chance because I read her poetry collection so probably in 2018 and I wanted to be impressed by it but I wasn't. The way that Ashgar narrates the story and writes the story is quite different than the typical narration style and I know that that was completely off-putting by many people. Very loud sirens. I was interested in this book and had had it on my Libby but what really pushed me to pick it up was the fact that it was long listed for the Carol Shields Prize and it ended up being shortlisted and then winning and I was so glad to see that. It was the book that I would have picked. It and Brown Girls were both shortlisted so like I could have had either of them but I was really really hoping for When We Are Scissors because it just blew me out of the water. This begins with Kasher when she's four years old and her father is murdered and then her and her two older sisters are moved to a cramped apartment with roaches 
her uncle is the one who is left to take care of them. And her uncle has married a white lady who it describes as, as she is approached middle age, she is not as enticed or enamored with her husband's foreignness as she was at 20. And we really see the way in which neglect and racism and all of those things play a role in their lives. The uncle is not willing to completely abandon them because that would be bad for his ability to get into heaven. And also he gets checks for having them in his custody, but he puts them in this terrible, small, stinking, roach-infested apartment. And he leaves the nine-year-old Noreen to take care of them, a five and four-year-old. And it is, that is abusive beyond what you can compare. And it plays with narrative because it writes these things and it writes these stories. And then we also have the uncle's name is redacted. And it is such an intensely personal and hard book. We, we follow these sisters who spend their childhood and adolescence and early adulthood together in this apartment and how it does. One of the quotes that I really loved is, sisters, a small world trying to hold us together. And we also have the description of her feeling frozen, not being able to say anything. And they're often referred to as sister mothers and it's looking at that adultification and that change of role. And I just think that it's such an ingenious book. It is a book that will stay with me for a really long time. And I just think the fact that it won the first Carol Shields prize is so good. Like I love that it will always have that honor. It makes me so happy. Now we get to the two big ones, my two favorite books of the year that I just, I have such a place in my heart that I, I can't even explain. The first one is Swimmers by Julia Suka, and this one has an entire review about it where I read it, where I gush and talk about my love. So if you're interested in the book, I really recommend it because I think that I can explain it there and the like height and my complete utter joy so much better than I can now. But this is another choral narration. It takes the point of view beginning with these swimmers, these people who are all in the pool, and we see their various different lives as they come and go. And then in them, we have Alice who is on her last lap. She's a woman who has dementia. She does not understand everything. She does not remember everything, but she remembers going to the pool. And then we move to the second narration. And in there, we have her daughter narrating all of the things that her mother can't remember and the things that she can. It is so incredibly moving and hard and difficult. And in this section, we also look at Japanese internment. And I went back and I read the two previous books that Julia Suga has published, and both of them deal with internment in really clear ways. And I think that that is such a powerful way that she is a narration. She has choral narration kind of throughout her three books that she's published over 20 years. And I cannot wait for what she does in the future because she has like cemented herself as one of my favorite novelists and an author that I just find mesmerizing and interesting. And all of these is so impactful. It's also something that happened to her own family. So it's a personal place. And she has written nonfiction as well about how her mother experienced dementia. So we know that this had some auto fiction as well in it. But then we move to the third one and it's from this all being, all knowing facility. And I found it slightly creepy, but like interesting. Like I love that kind of hint of like gothicness within a like kind of normal novel. And it's, it's so beautiful. And then the last section looks again at her last days. And it's, this book destroyed me. <laughs> and I think that emotionally and thematically, but also as an author, like I, I am emotionally invested in this book. I thought that it was brilliant, but as someone who, you know, fancies themselves a writer, the way that Julia Suka was able to use craft and different voices and different narration and different words and the way that she employed all these things is like mesmerizing to me. Like I so enjoy her as an author, which is also true of my favorite book of the year, Wandering Souls by Cecile Penn. This book, it captured my heart, made me cry, made me weep, made me like so impressed at the way that she wrote stories because we have all these overlapping things. We have the narration of these three siblings that are escaping from Vietnam shortly after the Vietnam War and they're trying to go to see their uncle and their parents and family are supposed to catch up with them. But the 16 year old is put in charge of her two next oldest siblings because there would be too many of them to escape unnoticed when they were all together. And 
we follow them through internment camps, we follow them being in Europe, we follow them in refugee housing, and I have chills on my back just thinking about the way in which she tells these stories and the humanness and the hardness. And we follow especially the oldest sister throughout her life, and we also look at the ways in which her brothers have been impacted by racism and lack of parents and poverty and all of these things throughout their lives as well. And then we also look at various different moments in which Vietnamese and different refugees had impacts on the world. So we look at this island in which many Vietnamese people were killed and hurt and assaulted during this period. We look at a lighthouse that still has the crawling of names. We have people pretending to be boys in order to avoid being assaulted. And we see all of the evidence of that and we see how that is now a tourist place. We see the ways in which in modern day in 2016 various refugees were put in a warehouse and starved to death and we see all of these lasting impacts of the way that immigration and refugees and people of color have been treated and then we also look at this voice that is trying to write this story and i love metafiction i love the way that it interacts with different stories and one of my favorite quotes of the year one of my favorite quotes ever is how to carve out a story between the macabre and the fairy tale and she really does this. She talks about how hard it is to tell the truth, to tell all of the hardship, but not make it something that is trying to be exploitative or, you know, like trauma porn, but instead trying to tell these stories, but also talk about the hope, talk about all of the different aspects, talk about how, you know, just because everything is hard does not mean that there was not hope, that there was not love, and just because there was hope and love does not mean that all of the pain was erased. And we see this, and it is talked about as a writer talks about this and I like I'm just in love with the way that this story happened and as I look back actually on most of these books a lot of them have to do with narration and writing and stories we have brown girls we have one we are sisters we have wandering souls and we have the swimmers all deal with narration and story in ways that are not typical we have stone blind that also deals with this as well and I love ensemble books I love books that talk on various different things and have special narration and I think that's always going to be the stories that really really resonate with me and this year was just such a marvelous year for favorites I love that I am still learning the kind of reader and the kind of writer I want to be and I'm learning that better so that I can focus on it more but I also am just loving loving fiction more than I ever thought. And I would love to know what the favorite books of your list were, what books that really wowed you, that, you know, cemented them in your soul, that like had fun writing things. I would love to know that.